be sung that portion he from death to life is brought son of God come to be Under the hymn writer said, I will sing of my redeemer. We come back to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I know some of you were probably thinking, or is think, or are thinking, or is thinking, whatever one it is. <laughs> Someone is thinking that. Uh oh, I think I'm gonna have some problems this morning. Yes, I will. Maybe you were thinking that. We would take up those parts of the armor this morning, but we're not. We'll be back in two weeks. As I kept looking, and it might be me, but I'm hearing feedback, and it's probably because my ears are extremely sensitive. It's not that. And one of the reasons why we're not taking up that part, because I can't get out of this little section. When I think about how Satan deceived Eve, and the whole world is in this universal mess, I just can't run through that little section. And when I think about the fact that Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 calls him the strong man whose arm, I just couldn't get out that section. And when I think about the fact that Michael in the book of Jude dared not contend with him but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. Couldn't leave that little section. Such a being. We dare not take lightly. He's dangerous. And I don't think we realize that. I know I don't. So we are back in Ephesians chapter 6. I want to read again verses 10 through 20. We'll just park somewhere between 11 and 13. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 20. Out of respect for the word of God, would you please stand? Let's hear the word of God together. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer 
and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you so much for standing. Let us pray together again. Our Father, we thank you again that you, our light, our fortress, our high tower, and you alone we trust. Father, may we not, when we not, may we not give ourselves to serving, to serving idols. But may we see you fresh as the true and living God. All of your glory and all of your splendor and all of your loveliness. May we see our great God who has done all things well in Jesus Christ. Father, may we see how you, out of your own kindness, out of your own love, out of your own goodness, according to your own good pleasure, has brought us into your royal family. How, Lord Jesus, you didn't pass us by, O oh, gentle Savior. How we thank you this morning that your heart is large enough large enough that you could find sinners where they are. And so we thank you that you have sent the Spirit to work, to get on sinners' trails, to track us down, to bring us to that love relationship in Jesus Christ so that we could cry, Abba, Father. How we thank you for coming after us when we had no interest in you. Make it all real this morning into our prayer. Help us now as we speak and as we listen and as we learn together and as we grow together. Help us as I'll cry. We pray for Brother Jeff as he preaches this morning. Father, give him the tongue of the learned. Help him to speak a word in due season. We pray that the congregation would be edified. Saints would have a, a sweet fellowship together. And your name, Lord Jesus, would be magnified in their midst. Now here, Father, any of us who are downcast, come with those everlasting arms and lift us up. Those of us who are perplexed, give us clarity of mind. Father, those of us who are stuck and just don't know what to do, give clear direction. Come to us as our prayer. If you don't come, we are gathering in vain. Hear our cry. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul has been <clears throat> instructing the church at Ephesus as to who they are and why they exist. He has told them how they became Christians and how they will stay Christians. I think, I think Paul has really set this up beautifully. This book has been so rich. I wish we could work through the whole thing. It's packed. This book is packed with truth. It's packed with beauty. It's packed with the Christian life right here in this book. He sets it up so beautifully because you cannot, I cannot, we cannot live chapters 4 through 6 if we miss chapters 1 through 3. Did you hear me? We cannot, we cannot do chapters 4 through 6 if we have not experienced chapters 1 through 3.
We can go to marriage chapter, the marriage chapter, that's chapter 5, and we can talk about marriage all we want. We can take marriage retreats and talk about it. We can have counseling sessions and talk about marriage all we want. But if we don't live the reality of chapters 1 through 3, that chapter won't mean anything. You can't do it successfully. We can preach it at weddings. We could rehearse it. But we need chapters 1 through 3. We can give instructions from chapter 6 concerning children's obedience and parental duties and read all of the child training manuals we want. But if we miss chapters 1 through 3, you won't be able to do it successfully. And that's Paul's point. He does not start with duty first. He starts with everything God has done. And in light of what God has done, if this has been your experience, Paul is saying, now do these things. Sometimes we just run through the other chapters and miss all the meat of those first three chapters. Those first three chapters are the foundation of how we live church life and family life. If we miss those chapters, we miss the heart of what Paul is saying. Paul has set it up not to bring us to the place of despair, but to set us in the place of encouragement. He shouts to us what God has done for us. Those are the first three chapters. We ought to take off. You see how Paul starts off the chapter, blessed be God. He's excited, blessed be God. All the things he has done for us in Jesus Christ. He's overwhelmed. He's taken up. After you read it, you would think Paul's charismatic. He's so excited. He says God has overwhelmed us with his grace and mercy. He's loved us before the foundation of the world. He's given us his son. He's raised us from the dead. He's adopted us into his family. He's forgiven us of our sins. He's sealed us with his spirit. He's brought us out of darkness and placed us in the light. That got Paul excited. Excited. In other words... God did everything it took to bring sinners to himself. Everything it took. You realize for salvation, it will cost God everything. God spares nothing when it comes to saving sinners, when it comes to establishing his family, when it comes to making that new creation. God gives everything, everything. done everything to bring us to himself and to lead us home. Everything. He's covered us with the royal righteousness of Jesus Christ, purchased us with his royal blood, brought us into his royal family, joined us to royal siblings so that we together as a family would worship and adore and be made like the royal savior. That's what he's doing. So Paul writes those three chapters so that we would be confident in God, comforted in God, and courageous in God. He tells the Ephesians and us, we were under the prince of the power of the air, chapter 2. That is the devil. But the overwhelming, as we said earlier, the overwhelming grace and mercy of God stepped in and delivered us. Have you been delivered? The overwhelming grace and mercy of God stepped in and delivered. 
and delivered. That's where we get a hallelujah. However, the forces, listen carefully, the forces that we were delivered from are very aware of this, and they are fighting back. If you don't realize that, you are in trouble. We've been delivered, delivered from the evil one, delivered from the power of darkness, brought into the kingdom of God's dear son. And that dark kingdom is fighting back. Clarence, let that sink in. That is why we have chapter 6. Satan is a blazing fire, a master arsonist. Children, that's just what, someone who just likes to light, fire, light things on fire and burn things up, burn things down. He's a master arsonist. He knows how to bring in the heat. And he does not mind burning churches, and I'm not talking about buildings, buildings, to pieces. He doesn't mind doing it. He's very good at it. He knows how to stir things up in a congregation to a point where anger is blazing, gossip is blazing, unforgiveness is blazing, immorality is blazing until things are out of control. He knows how to do it. Read those churches in Revelation chapters 3, 2 and 3. Seven of them, Jesus only commends two. He rebukes five. And he says to one, I know what Satan sees this. Out of control. He knows how to do it. We, we, we dare not then, we dare not give to the enemy the fuel for the fire. That's why we have chapter 4. Well, that brings us then to verse 11. After Paul tells us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, letting us know that we cannot, we cannot stand unless we have strength outside of ourselves. We need another source. We need another strength. We can't depend on human strength at all. We sing it in our hymn. And one of the hymns, I think, is 477. We ought to know it. Stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. They understood this. Put on the gospel armor. Where did they get that from? Right here. Right here. He told us that we need power from the Lord. And not only just power, we need almighty power. He said we need the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That will take everything. Can I say it this way? It will take everything God has. That's what we need. We need everything God will give us. So he comes to put on the whole armor of God. The verbal command, put on, carries the sense of clothing oneself. Paul said, I want you to get into your outfit. This is our second head we had before, just one. Standing firm, the command to suit up. We looked at be strong last time. It's the command to suit up. Clothing oneself. This lets us know that we need to suit up. Paul has told us that our source of strength, as we said, must come from the Lord. We must be strengthened by his mighty power. And this power, as I said, is none other than the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Ephesians 1.19 now he tells us that our source of protection must come from the Lord. Not only does our strength come from the Lord, but we need also the protection from the Lord. The putting on then signifies that we need 
not part, not half, but every piece of the armor. Just like God provided his own righteousness because we must, because we must have it in order to enter heaven. So he provides the armor because we must have it if we are going to survive in this battle. We have to have it. So to stand then means we will need everything God has or God will provide. But not only does he tell us to put on the whole armor in verse 11, he gives us the reason why. You see it in the next few words, that ye may be able to stand. You need the strength. You need the armor so you can stand. The word stand has several meanings. It can mean to stand still. It can mean to take your position. Or it can mean stand up to, to resist. I think here it carries the meaning of taking your position and standing up to the enemy with resistance. We are to stand fearlessly, fearlessly. But what's interesting in the passage, Paul never tells us, I want you to advance. You don't see that. He did not say, charge forward. He does not even say, back up and retreat. By the way, he would not say that because in the Greco-Roman world, that's shameful. That's embarrassing to retreat. Paul says, no, stand and don't move. We ought to stand. We are not to wave the white flag of surrender. He does not tell us to go and find the enemy. You don't see that in the passage. Why would he, why, why would he not say that? You know why? Because the enemy is coming to you. That's why. Who or what are we to stand against? Still in verse 11. Put on the whole arm of God that we may be able to stand I put we, ye, you, plural, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He calls it the wiles of the devil. That is, the schemes, craftiness, strategies, the attacks of the devil. You know what I like about this? If I could say I liked about it. Paul makes it clear on who the enemy is. We don't have to figure it out. He tells us. He, he's not hiding it from us. He tells us who the enemy is. He tells us who's going to or trying to do us spiritual harm. He has identified the enemy. It's called the devil. It's also amazing in the passage that the devil knows who we are. Not only does Paul identify him, he knows who we are because he's coming with schemes. We find the same thing in Acts chapter 19. We read that two weeks ago. Jesus I know. Remember those spirits? Paul I know. But who are you? He knows who we are. It's a shame that if the enemy knows who we are and we don't know who he is. If that is the case, if we don't know who the enemy is, if we can't even recognize the enemy, we are doomed for failure. 
Paul goes on, he doesn't even hide his method of attacks from us. Wiles, schemes, trickery. Satan has a planned method. He's good at it, y'all. He is a trickster, a schemer. He knows how to maneuver. He knows how to work from the bottom up and from the top down. He has a well-crafted battle scheme for his attacks. He has a bag of tricks, and he knows how to use each one very well. There are no new tricks with him. You know why? I told you before. Because the ones he has been using still work. No new tricks. He's successful. Paul says we need to be able to recognize his tactics when they come. Why? Because the enemy is coming. That's why. We need to be on guard. We need to be alert. Paul said he has schemes. He has trickeries. I've told you some of them before. One of them we find in chapter 4, false teaching. We may come back to that. He is coming to us. He is coming to the home, and he's coming to the church. I wish it wasn't so. Young people, let me say this for a moment. Satan knows what to put in front of your eyes. You hear me? You better realize that. Satan knows what to put in front of your eyes. He knows exactly what to put in front of you to help you damage you. With the advance of technology and nearly every household possessing smartphones and or computers, he knows exactly what to set before you. He has websites just for you. He has phone apps just for you. He, I hate to put this title on him, but I'm going to tell you, he, or this adjective, he is brilliant. Brilliant. We need to know who he is. And Paul doesn't hide that from us. He has websites that will shipwreck you. Even shipwreck your purity. Interestingly, 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 he has a clever way and perfect timing of bringing things your way when no one else is around. When you're all by yourself. You heard me say it before. The real you is who you are when you're all by yourself. He knows how to do it. He knows how to make you click that mouse. Or something you should not be looking at. He's brilliant. He knows your weaknesses. You better know them. He's brilliant. He uses work computers as well as home computers. He's clever and his timing seems to always be right. With Wi-Fi hotspots everywhere, one has instant, 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 instant access to the whole world. Instant. May I add, he also has instant access to a world of trouble. Satan knows what to sit before you and before me. We better be on guard. Husband that has a problem with his wife looking at his phone, checking his phone, and vice versa, <laughs> has a real big problem. 
shouldn't be a problem unless you have something to hide. If one cannot, if a spouse really cannot do something like that with their spouse, just check accountability because you love each other. If you can't do that, you have a bigger problem than the phone. The enemy is working, and he's doing his job well. Well, the home and the church are the two places mostly he attacks. There is an enemy. There is an enemy, and we must recognize this. There is an enemy who is after us, who will stay on our trail until we give in or give up. Unless we stand against him. He is determined. And he will not. Slow down one bit. We need to understand and remind ourselves that we are not in heaven. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you realize that. We're, we're on earth. I know we're living in America. I know we have so many things we enjoy in America. I, I know you, you, you just love your medical field. And everything like that. Some people say, no, would you go to Mexico and get a surgery? Yes, you love your medical field. And so I know you like your medical field and everything. And you appreciate all of the things we have in the country. But this is not heaven. It's not heaven. We are traveling through enemy territory. See, the church of Ephesus understood this. Remember the temple of Artemis? One of the seven wonders of the world. Remember that big place, 250,000 people. The temple is the main attraction. Not only that, they have emperor worship. You could see people everywhere going to that temple, coming from all over the known world at that time to worship Artemis. Idol shops are everywhere, and this church is in the midst of that. Oh, you think the enemy knows who they are? Of course. He has his eyes on them. Matter of fact, he has not taken his eyes off of them. We are in enemy territory. We are strangers and sojourners heading toward the celestial city. However, we will not get to that city without a fight, without a struggle, without conflict. Oh, I wish we could just ease on up there. I wish it was that way, but it is not. Christian life is one of continual watchfulness and fighting. In the language of my dad, as I said last time, it's a fight on the heavyweight level. We're fighting the big boys. And the big boys know how to fight. The big boys are a force. That's why Paul is telling the Ephesians, look at everything God has done for you. I want you to understand how he's blessed you with all spiritual blessing. Your seat is in heaven in Jesus Christ. That's your position. But you have some practical things that you have to work out here on earth. He's brought you nigh. He's turned, torn down the wall of partition. He's brought you into the family, Gentile and Jew, into one family making a new creation. And he has given you his son. And he has given you his spirit. And you can call him father. And you have access to him. And you are joying him him but there's a fight because there's an enemy he has his eyes on you and he's coming he's coming he tells us not only that he tells us whom we are wrestling against not only these wiles and these schemes these trickery of the devil as we seen before bad teaching in chapter 4 we also has, have this unity that's why Paul encourages them in chapter 4 verse 1 he said I want you to do something I want you to work hard and maintaining unity I want you to understand you have one father one Lord one spirit and you're in one body meaning you're one family 
And I, know, I want you to understand something else. You need to put away bitterness. You need to put away anger. You need to be tenderhearted. You need to be kind. You need to be forgiven. Listen, don't lie. Tell the truth. Don't steal. Work for what you need. He spells this out in chapter 4. And he said, by the way, by the way, if you don't do these things, Satan is going to stick his foot in there. And you don't want him to do that because he's dangerous. Then he goes to chapter 5 and tells us about submitting. And he gives us three categories. Wives submits to the husband. And then he comes with the children submitting to the parents. Then he goes with slaves submitting to the master. And he said, none of that can be done. None of that can be done if you miss these other things, what God has done. And if you don't do these things, Satan is going to do some dangerous work, some damaging work in that place. Whom are we wrestling against? He tells us, he tells us, he uses some interesting words. He said, not against, but against. Not against flesh and blood. I put a little caveat in there because all we see is flesh and blood. He said, our primary fight is not against flesh and blood, even though we see flesh and blood. It's a wrestling. The word could also mean struggling. It's a battle. But notice he uses the word wrestle because the Ephesians are very familiar with that. Not only do they have one of the seven wonders of the world in the temple of Artemis or Diana, but they also have a coliseum that seats about 25,000, and they're familiar with wrestling matches. Paul speaks in the language that the people could understand. That's what he did. And they understand that wrestling is not done from a distance. I don't know if any of you ever wrestled before, but I can tell you right now, wrestling, wrestling will use all of your muscles, every last one of them. Wrestling is close up, hand-to-hand combat. Paul said this thing is close with the enemy. He's not some distant one. He's close up. Our wrestling then is against another, not each other. You hear me? Paul we're not wrestling against each other. We are wrestling another. But I like how Paul did it. Paul said, first Paul said, put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand. You may be able to stand. Second person, you, you. But when he gets to verse 12, he says, we. He includes himself in it. We are wrestling. We are not trying. Like I said, we're not wrestling each other. We're wrestling another. We are not trying to step on top of each other or outdo each other or are competing with each other. No, that's not what we're doing. We are wrestling together because we need each other. That's Paul's point. It is not a you fight. It is a we fight. We fight together. And if we don't understand the big picture of being in a family, we won't understand The we fight. Our wrestling, he tells us, are against unseen forces. And that makes it difficult because we can't see them. But it is a fight in which we must stand toe to toe, fearless. Arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder. You know, when I, when I played football, I dare not get my linemen, that's the one who's stand on the line, bend down on the line, I dare not get those linemen upset. There's a wise reason for that. They have to block for me. 
I needed them. And they needed me to run for them. And when we won, did you hear what I said? We won. Didn't matter how many touchdowns I got. Didn't matter how many recorded yards I had. When we won, when we had a W, when we fell in a W column, and we had a lot of those. When we fell in that column, it wasn't I. We won as a team. And when we fell in that L column, we lost as a team. And when we won, we celebrated as a team. And when we lost, we cried as a team. And it didn't matter what differences we had, and we had some differences, but when we stood on the field, we were one, we were a team. Paul po Paul's point is similar with that illustration. No matter what your personality makeup is, no matter what petty differences you may have, Paul is saying when you stand on the battlefield, if you are not standing as one, you won't stand. You won't stand. It's not going to happen. So we fight. Now do you fight. We understood when I played as a team, we were going to defeat our opponent, we had to play together. We had to fight together. <sighs> Paul has something else here for us. Actually, Nehemiah has the picture in Nehemiah chapter 4 of what I'm talking about. He says this right here. He said, and I looked, the enemy was around, they're trying to build a wall. He says these words, and I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Oh, I love that. Remember the Lord. Don't be afraid. Fearless. Remember the Lord. Which is great and terrible. Here it is. The Lord. But listen what he tells them. Fight. Remember the Lord. Fight for your brethren, for your sons, for your daughters, for your wives, and for your household. That's the picture. He said the enemy is round, around us, but together we will fight. We're fighting for others. That's the idea. We have to fight. How spiritual well-being depends upon it. We ought to fight. Looking to the Lord. We ought to look to the one who came into the world. Willingly, we ought to look to the one who lived sinlessly. We ought to look to the one who died sacrificially. We ought to look to the one who rose victoriously. We ought to look to the one who ascended gloriously. We ought to look to the one who is ruling the world powerfully. And we ought to look to the one who is returning to judge the world righteously. We look to the Lord. We look to the Lord. What a glorious place to look. You ever looked at those nail scarred hands? You ever looked and took your tent, if I could say, pitch your tent right at Calvary and say, I just want to stay here and just look at Jesus for a little while. And then I want to go by the empty tomb and I want to stay here and just look at that empty tomb for a little while because he's not there. And I want to gaze up into heaven and I just want to gaze at the right hand of the Father and know that there's one on the throne praying for me. That's where I want to look. And I could stand in the great hope that he's coming back. To get me, but not just me, his whole family. That's what we want to look. He's the one coming. Paul uses some words here. He uses these words of principalities. You see it? Our battle is not against flesh and blood. We're not battling human beings. Now, let me say this real quick. Satan does use human beings. He used Judas. He used Haman. He used others. He uses human beings. He said, our battle, our fight, our struggle is not against human beings per se, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this world, and against spiritual wickedness. Now, whether those particular categories, if we want to call it that, 
refers to different ranks among the angelic beings. Schol some scholars think so. I don't know. But the bottom line is this. Paul is saying, we are up against an army. We have a battle before us. And the enemy, Satan at the helm, is coming from every direction. Every angle. That's what's clear from the verse. He attacks from everywhere. And like I said, what makes the battle so intense is they are unseen. But this is not fun and games. We are dealing with a massive army. We are called to be soldiers, not only a family, but soldiers. We are dealing with a massive army that knows how to fight. It is very skillful. This particular army, as I said, has Satan at the helm, and it knows when to attack, how to attack, and where to attack. It's skillful. But let me remind you, you probably already know this, this army does not play fair. It never has. It never will. It doesn't fight fair. It knows all the tricks and schemes to rip things up. It has been at this as long as the earth has been in existence. That's a long time. <laughs> the members of this army, listen carefully. This is one of the reasons I couldn't move out of the passage. The members of this army even know how to dress like their opponent. Did you hear me? The members of this army knows how to dress like their opponent. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Maybe I should just do this. Let me prove it to you. Yeah. Our Lord said in Matthew chapter 7, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Did you hear what he said? Sheep's clothing. The enemy knows how to put on the garment of its opponents so it could blend in and go unnoticed. Jesus says, but inwardly, they are ravening wolves. They look like sheep on the outside. And they dress up like sheep. And they gather with the sheep. But when they're not with the sheep, they have on their wolves' clothes. They know how to blend in. They know how to dress like the sheep. We better take heed and pay close attention. Jesus said, beware. Pay close attention. Take heed. Beware is the warning to us because there are woes out there dressed up like sheep. They have learned how to sing the songs of the church. <laughs> they have learned how to say the prayers with the church. They have blended in with the fellowship of the church. They even know how to talk some of the theology of the church. Yet they have no love, no heart for the Lord of the church. They know how to put on the clothing of their opponent in order to do damage. Jesus says, the life, he said, you would know them by the fruit. The life will tell a story sooner or later. The members of this army, like I said, know how to dress like their, uh, their opponent. They are vicious and they are destructive and they are dangerous. And many times, as I said, they go unnoticed until it's too late and the damage is done. We need to know what's going on. Families and in the church, we need to be on guard. 
Parents, you need to know what your children have on their phones. You need to know what they're listening to. You need to know what they're watching. You need to know. I know they've grown up a little bit. Yeah, we're going to give them a little space. Yeah, give them some space. But you still need to know. They came from the same stuff you came from. Sometimes we think, man, but they just cut out of heaven. They're not going to do anything. Oh, yeah. Until we're shocked and say, I didn't know you was doing this. How long you been doing this? Three years. We better know what's going on. The enemy is clever. That fruit looked pretty good to Eve, didn't it? It looked pretty good. God said you could have anything in the garden except that tree right there. The tree of life was in there. They didn't eat of the tree of life. They'd rather eat from the tree of death. Enemy knows how to tell children, hide it from your parents. <laughs> children, you should be able to ask your parents things. Too. That's not disrespectful. Daddy, what are you doing on your phone? <laughs> Check up on him. What are you doing, Daddy? Parents try to get away with things, too. No. No. I sit down with my computer. The children jump up on my lap. Daddy, what are you looking at? I can't go, no, nothing. No, that's what I'm looking at. I have nothing to hide. We, we can't afford to cruise. Some of you know what I'm talking about. We've cruised, and it did damage, and it was too late. We can't afford to do it. We can't. The Lord said, beware, keep close watch. Paul did the same thing. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, he got wind that apostolic teaching was being undermined by those who crept in. Did you hear the word I used? Crept in. And said these words, for such are false apostles. Yes, people were coming saying, we're apostles. Yeah, of who? Jesus Christ. Where are apostles? Paul said, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers. Here's the word. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. They look like the real thing. They wore the same clothing. I'm not talking about this outward stuff. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Yes, they were going around, I said, saying they're the real thing. And Paul said, and no marvel for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Our enemy and his army knows how to dress like the opponent. The text says they know how to transform. They know how to put on. I want to use the word of that old man again. Mr. Marlow was his name. Lost as lost could be. But he said to me, you can only pretend so long. They transform. They know how to fit in with the crowd. They get together. I could talk a little Bible with you a little bit, but they're not interested in the Bible. Sing a little song, yes, yes, but I'm not interested in the words of those songs. The Corinthians, just in case you didn't know, I trust you do. This passage I just read refers primarily to teachers, and their teaching affected the life of the church. The church at Corinth got to a point where some was denying the resurrection. That's the heart of Christianity. There's no Christianity without the resurrection. One more example then of the members of this army wearing the clothing of their opponent. Paul's admonition to the, listen, the elders of Ephesus. Did you hear? The elders of Ephesus. Listen what he told the elders of that church we're talking about. Listen what he said. 
as he called them to himself in Acts chapter 20 at Miletus and declared unto them how he had been faithful, how he had preached the whole counsel of God, how he had not kept back anything from them that he thought would be profitable, but he declared unto them repentance toward God, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul said, I'm going to finish my course with joy because I'm clear, I'm clean from the blood of all men. He told those elders, take heed. Those words, take heed, is the same word Jesus used, beware. The underlying word. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, that's the church, all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseer to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Notice he didn't say your church. He says the church of God. Purchased with his own blood. And here it is. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous woes. Didn't Jesus say something about woes? Shall grievous woes enter in among you, not sparing the flock. That would be sobering enough to hear the apostle Paul say this. But he did not stop there. He said, also of your own selves, talking to the elders, listen, also of your own selves, right among you, shall men arise speaking perverse things. <sighs> I'd have died if I was there, right there on the spot. From among your own selves. Be, be like, is it I? Are you talking about me? Also from among your own selves will men arise speaking perverse things to draw disciples away after them. That word perverse has to do with the potter's wheel. When it would sit something, an object on the potter's wheel and keep changing it and shaping it and changing it and shaping it and reforming it. Paul is saying to them, yeah, you take the truth and put it on the potter's wheel and you just shape that thing and reuse that thing, reshape that thing, refashion that thing so no one can recognize what it is. He said, don't do that. Take the word of God and make it say something else. Draw people after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one of you night and day. Paul said, I've been telling you about this for three years. Three years. You love it? Can you imagine being there? As I said, and hearing those words from the lips of Paul. Take heed. Take heed. Paul warns the elders that wolves are on the prowl and that they will not spare to split apart the flock. They're going to rise even from among the leadership. Some of them who wants a following to say anything to get that following, even if it means twisting the word of God. Now he speaks to that same church. The enemy is there. The enemy is coming. Jesus speaks to that same church later on in Revelation chapter 2 and saying, you got some good stuff, but you're pretty cold-hearted. The love is gone. We don't want to lead anything astray. We don't want to water down the gospel in any kind of way. We don't want to take away from the message in any kind of way. One man who's gone to glory has said it wonderfully, I think. He said the gospel has become so watered down that if it were poison, it would not harm anyone. And if it were medicine, it would not heal anyone. We tend not temper with the word. Now Paul says something else. Not only are we fighting against these rulers, principalities, which could be means just rulers and powers, which means authority. That could even mean the government authority right there in Ephesus or the government authority in the Roman Empire itself. Spiritual wickedness, rulers of darkness is what he calls them, the prince of the ages. He says... 
Interestingly, in verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor. Didn't he just tell them that? Why do he have to tell us that again? He just said in verse 11, put on. He comes to verse 13 and says, take up. Something interesting. He never says, take off. Take up. Why would he say that again? I can tell you my own little sanctified imagination. I think it's because we are prone not to take things seriously. He tells us twice, if you are going to be in this battle, you need strength and you better have God's armor or you won't stay. We tend to not realize the danger until it's too little, too late. One man has said it this way, evil, evil rarely looks evil until it accomplishes its goal. It gains interest, entrance by appearing attractive, desirable, and perfectly legitimate. It is a baited and camouflage trap. Close quote. J.C. Ryle has said it this way. He calls it sugared, covered poison. It looks good. It looks good. It may even feel good. But we don't know the damage that's coming later. I believe I told you, I think, by the church, I know. Pastor's still a good friend of mine, good brother of mine. I think I told you a couple of weeks ago, 400 plus, thriving. This church had even opened up a pregnancy resource center. They had medical vehicles going around and giving people medical service and everything. The whole city knew about this church. 400 plus. They have 30 members right now. 30 people meet on Sunday morning. Five on Wednesday. There were over 400. It wasn't because they had bad doctrine. They had sound doctrine. Can I say something? Sound doctrine, hear me carefully. Sound doctrine will not hold things together alone. Sound doctrine won't do it. I don't care how much sound doctrine you have. Why would you say something like that, Clarence? Sound doctrine didn't hold it together. A congregation can know and adhere to all of the sound creeds and confession and church history. It can know all of the theological terminology. It can be Bible-based to the bone. None of those things will hold it together. Please don't misunderstand me. Hans, you say we need bad teaching? That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying at all. <laughs> we need sound doctrine. We need to preach and teach sound doctrine faithfully. However, however, sound doctrine alone won't hold us together. Can I prove it to you? Israel had sound doctrine. Did you hear what I said? Israel had the faithful prophets that preach over and over again sound doctrine, but it didn't keep the nation from, the, from disaster. Moses gave Israel good sound teaching, and while he was on the top of the mountain, you remember Exodus chapter 32? Moses is on the top of the mountain getting more instruction from God. He's already given them the commandments in chapter 20. He's on, now we get to chapter 32, he's on the mount. The glorious cloud is there. God's presence right there on the mount. Everyone could see it. At the bottom, down at the bottom of the mount, the foot of the mount, guess what Israel is doing? Making a calf. And saying, this is the, this is the one. These are the gods that brought us out of Egypt. These are the ones that delivered us. My friends, listen. To me, that's always scary for me because I have to be careful because that lets me know God's presence can be so near, but it doesn't keep you from committing idolatry. He 
he's right on the top. They're right at the bottom. And they are so bold to commit idolatry with the presence of God right there. Folks do it all the time. Folks come in the church building. Church building. And know they are living <laughs> like hell. And they come right there. Where God and his people meet together, they come right in the building, shake their head sometime a couple of times, and they come over and over and hear sermons over and over and over and over, and their lives are fruitless. Fruitless. You can have the presence of God without having God. That's why I say sound doctrine alone will not do it. Making a golden calf. God's presence can be near their people. We can hear sermons. Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? If I may say it this way. Isn't it amazing that we can hear sermons year after year, profess the Savior, and walk like we have no power? Sound doctrine is not enough. It has to have something with it. And I know what you're thinking. Ha! He's going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That's not what I'm going to mention. We have to have the Spirit. Don't get me wrong. We have to have good doctrine. Sound doctrine is designed to be heard, embraced, and put into practice. In other words, its goal is sound, healthy living. Sound doctrine and sound living has to go hand in hand. Sound doctrine by itself will not do it. That's what Paul has been saying before the Ephesians. He gave them sound doctrine, sound doctrine, sound doctrine, sound doctrine. And if they have been, and let me say it this way, if they have experienced what has happened in those three chapters to them by God, then they will have sound living. We need sound doctrine for sound living. If we have sound doctrine with no practice of it, we can expect disaster. We are not here just to gather. For gathering's sake. We are not to read the word just for reading the word's sake. We are gathering to hear from the master and to take what the master says and live it. If we're not doing that, sooner or later, disaster is bound to happen. Paul says to Timothy, and the reason why I'm mentioning Timothy, because Timothy is in Ephesus. He said, let everyone that names the name of God, foundation stand as sure, let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Can we just put that simply? If we are naming the name of Christ, if we are calling ourselves Christians, naming the name of Christ, we ought to be departing from iniquity. If we are not departing from iniquity, we need not name the name of Christ. Okay. If our lives are contrary to the book, to the book, then we need to change our character or change our name. Paul says, take unto you the whole armor of God. And it's amazing, he tells us again, so that you may be able to to withstand so that you may be able to resist. Resist. Strength and armor is what we need. Source of strength and source of protection. We got to have every bit of it. And he says, so that you may be able to stand in the evil day. He said, there's a particular day coming when it will be very intense. And unless you look at yourself as a body, 
You won't be able to stand. And then he tells them something else, still putting the responsibility. He didn't say, I want you to roll all that thing over on the Lord. That's not what he said. He said, you stand. You. And then he goes on so boldly to say, you need to do everything you can to stand. We'll be fighting all our days. I think I see it more and more. We'll be fighting all of our days as long as we breathe. You know, we all, we praise the Lord as long as things are going well. That's why I know I do. Praise Him when things are going well. Oh, we love the praises of the Lord. We love singing the psalms, don't we? We love reading the psalms, the beautiful portions of Scripture. We love all of that stuff. We say, yes, I love Jesus until, uh, uh, until, until that until comes. You know, when the, when the word of God stands in front of what we want to do. See, we, we're, we're all right until. And you can put anything in the Until. How about the lost family members? Yes, we're, we're all right with what the word of God says. He's put us in a new family. Matter of fact, that new family is the most important family, if you didn't know that. So everything is fine until the until. When God stepped forward and said, no, 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 my word says this. You want to do this? Oh, man. We try to find a way around it. That's your interpretation. Until. We all right with God until he stands up against what we want to do. We fight until we breathe our last. Not only will we be fighting all of our days, but God will be working on us all of our days until we look more like Jesus Christ. That's what he's doing. The battle is designed, yes, to grow us. The battle is also designed to unify us. That's what a battle is designed for. Courage in Jesus Christ. You know what I love about this portion? Paul has already told them in the book. That's why I was saying about the first three chapters. He's already told them Jesus has the victory over principalities and powers. See, if you miss that, you won't stand. That's the bedrock. We ought to have the armor. We ought to have the word of God, which he's going to get to that. We ought to bathe these things in prayer. We ought to have that. We ought to look to our great master because he's a great master. <sighs> we will not look fully like Jesus until we get the glory. And you and I ought to look more like Jesus until we get the glory. <laughs> Paul says to this group, I want you to have on your military uniform. I want you to stand firm because you have an enemy that's dangerous. He's coming in your home and he's coming in your church. And I want you to be able to recognize you need to have eyes for that enemy. That enemy is dangerous. That enemy is destructive. That enemy even knows how to talk sweet. That enemy even knows how to say the right thing. You get to Acts chapter 17, you find the girl possessed with a demon saying to Paul them, these men are the servants of the most high God that shows us the way of salvation. That was actually right. See, demons know how to say the right thing to mingle in. Paul picked up on it. Cast the demon out. This church in Ephesus has its hands full with family members, no doubt, with friends, no doubt. They are in the heart of wickedness, like I said, with idolatry all around. And Paul is calling them to stand against what they have been called out of. What a task. Don't go back. You ever been tempted to go back? You ever been tempted to give up? You ever been tempted to just throw it all away? Have you ever come to the point where you say, what's the use? <laughs> what's the use? I'm t I've done all of this. Why? Why, why? why do it? Why? Have you ever been there? Boss, I want you to look one way. 
I want you to look to the master. I want you to see what God has done. Remember, you were far off. You were alien. And God has brought you nigh through the blood of his son. Do you realize it was the blood of his son? He's brought you nigh. And he's made you one of his. And he has an eternal place for you. So fight on. Fight on. Well, let's stop. As God works on us, in us, and for us, there are enemies of heaven who are working against us. And we need to recognize that. We have a dangerous enemy in Satan, and he has help. And his help are good helpers. And he doesn't mind at all using them to the fullest. Also, we got to take heed in our families, husband and wife, parents and children. And we have to take heed in the church, how we respond and how we react to one another. If we don't see it, our togetherness, our oneness, family. You're going to hear me keep saying those words because that's what Paul is going after. If we don't see the family, if we are just ones we go to church with and that's it. <sighs> the enemy sooner or later put his foot right in the midst and do damage. Got to be like the Roman soldiers. We'll talk about them. Shoulder to shoulder. They stood and they were not supposed to back up. There's no protection in the back. That's why you don't retreat. You stand shoulder to shoulder. And as long as they stood shoulder to shoulder, they were invincible. And that's what Paul is calling us to. Shoulder to shoulder, as a family, looking to Christ, strengthened by him, walking in his armor, and standing, and don't move. May God help us to do so for his glory. For his praise. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you again that you are a great king and a great Lord. We are reminded, Father, that we are so slow, so slow to learn, so slow to walk, Father, so slow to even to obey. God, forgive us when we take light your mercies, when we take light your grace, when we don't grow in righteousness, when we don't grow in the way of true holiness. Father, when we seem to be stagnant, God, don't leave us this way. Please work powerfully that it would be such a glorious transform that we indeed would look more and more like our master. We would thrive. We would flourish. Father, we would be excited about him. God, he was excited about us. So strengthen the flock here. Bless and encourage all we pray from the youngest to the oldest. Father, help us to be on guard against the schemes of the wicked one. Please, our Father. May we be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. Actually, we'll sing another hymn. Jessica? 281. Before I read. Oh.
Oh, may we like soldiers, faithful, true, and bold, fight as the saints who nobly fought of all and win with them the victor's crown of gold. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication, for all saints. Amen. I'll be with you till we meet again.